ever been lit once? You know, as long as I've got my laptop, a book I'm reading, and I can learn, and I can have a shisha, I'm happy. You're in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. There's one space in the boat, you can only save one brand. There's Trapstar, there's Benja, you have to save one brand. So is that your favourite one, this one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just like classy and clean. Hold on a minute. You're a nice bubbly girl or guy on your YouTube channel, but you're actually an asshole in person. So what do you think of Kanye West then? I woke up on Instagram one time and I see, I see my, uh, sorry, Twitter blowing up. And I'm seeing, I think it was Clint, he said something like black on black crime. I invited you to the gala before. I, I didn't even see that, you know. No, I reckon you're sorry for I ain't going out. Nah. Yes. Yo, what's happening? Big Reese. You good? What's happening, bro? How you doing? Good. You good? You good. Uh, it's an honor, man. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. You know, there's a there's a rapper, his name's Tricky. And when I was younger, he had this line. It was like, me and my niggas, that's a mill in the room. <laughs> and when I was younger, I used to look at my friends in the room, I'd be like, yeah, we're like, we're like 300,000, 400,000. But see now that you're in my car, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've done incredibly well for yourself. I want to get people to know a bit more about you because I feel like you're very misunderstood personally. But I feel like people just sometimes have just gone off something that you may have said on Twitter mm. and then based their whole perception of you from that. But when you take time out to really listen to the things that you have to say, I think that you're an incredible businessman and person. So I wanted to get to know a bit more about you. I feel like... That misconception um, is, it's been the same since a kid, you know. Everything was centered around women or style or being a man in school. So people would kind of like make up a rumor and hold on to it just to paint me as a bad person or to, to downplay what I was doing at the time. So yeah, like I said, it's been that way for 20, 20 years, you know what I'm saying? So, so you've never really minded that? No, nah, no, nah, I've lived in London for what? three, four years now, and I've never experienced a single moment of hate. It's normally like a level of awe or respect. People would say, I read your tweets, you've changed my life, or you changed the way I think, or I, I, I've watched your journey for 10 years, you know what I'm saying? So what, you know, hate is allowed, and you know, people who admire you are quiet, and the people who admire you are on a progress of, a, a path of progress. They're just doing their thing, you know, they're not gonna come and jump to defend me. So I get that. Um, but like I said, the real world is where it matters. Uh, Do you feel like, although that you've kind of, it might not have been your intention at times in, in terms of some of your tweets, for example, obviously none of us are perfect. Do you feel like maybe some of them you could have communicated a little bit better or do you stand by nah, nah, nah. most of your tweets? I stand by. You stand everything. by all your tweets? Of yeah. course, you know, everything can be interpreted in two ways or many ways, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I never, I never say anything to kind of like, you know, rile it up. And being smart, I kind of know the smart people are going to see it one way and the, the people who want to create a narrative are going to take something the other way. And even all of the people who chirp on, up online, and I guess this irritates me a little bit. When I go to my DMs, more often than not, they've, they've sent me a DM in the past saying, your inspiration or love what you're doing. But because I don't really check them too often or I see them late, by the time I've seen them or checked in and seen someone hating and I looked on my Insta to see if they messaged me, they've deleted it or it just says message request, you understand? So yeah. I understand that most people are kind of like fans turned hate because I don't probably engage with them how they want me to engage with them or I just don't see. And I guess because I'm very to myself as a person, I just do my thing and mind my own business. And because people don't get to see me in the flesh, it allows them to run away with a narrative. But a lot of people in the industry, they know me on a personal level and I've, you know, all of the people that are somebody, they've either been to my house or they've, we've spoken of out throughout the years, but like I said, they're not the people who are gonna come and run to defend me because they know me as a person anyway. What's your relationship been like with UK music in terms of what you've done in the fashion world? When I first started the brand, obviously the brand was, um, like a completely different direction to what it is now because I'm what 32 now, I was 22 when I started the brand. And when I started it was obviously I was playing football at the time, I was just wearing tracksuits to training every day so you know that's what type of products I was making, I wanted to make. Uh, it was kind of like inspired by the 
Ricardo Tisky Javancha era, which was like the Watch the Throne era. I remember going to the concert and thinking, yo, these outfits are crazy. And that was a big inspiration for me at the time. So I kind of wanted to make very like black leather, you know, the, the contrasting fabrics but being uh, primarily monochrome. So I was making tracksuits at the time. So I remember, uh, I think it was uh, Fecky and uh, they did the Don't Waste My Time video. So yeah. I remember it was like Fecky, Crept Scraps and Nine, and Crept, yeah. Them man all showed love um, early doors. So I remember like just sending out a few things to them at the time. Um, and then, yeah, I remember Fecky and it might have been Crept too, I'm not sure, but definitely Fecky, he was, uh, rocking the clothes in the video and obviously that was a that track I think was a, it's still a big track to be honest but that was quite a moment for UK and a crossover to America so, and they're my type of type of guys as well you know like kind of old school being what 32 like as much as I respect the new rap scene in UK and US it's not really my type of thing so like the scrapses and the nines and the old school you know kind of like live by like the old code and principles they're my type of type of guys. And I know like you're a big Jay-Z fan. I yeah, think yeah, you yeah. are a big Jay-Z fan. I think I've seen like some pictures of some artwork and stuff that mm. you've had. So I'm pretty sure that you drew some inspiration from him and some of his successes. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, as we all have. But in terms of like British, core British music, who would you say has been your favourite artist from here? Uh, scraps and Nines, man, you know, they just keep it, they keep it 100 and you can see that. And I live by that old school, I'm a man of principle. Um, so I try and lay low, focus on doing what I need to do. Um, again, young black men, we want to shine too. So, you know, we all do that as well, naturally. Um, obviously it's always a problem when I do that, but uh, yeah, I'm just like, I like the old school people who I know, there's no lies in their raps, there's no lies in their bars and they live what they talk. And, Again, I, I think in the modern world, um, a lot of people are influenced by people who aren't really living what they talk about, and that's um, very relevant in rap mostly. Um, and it's kind of like a, a virus, you know, because it kind of p makes, makes people stretch themselves too far and uh, it, it costs them down the line. So I feel like whilst I'm not saying scraps and lines, you know, that at the end of the day they were drug dealers so I'm not saying that's the best influence but at least what they were saying is what they lived and they wasn't telling you to do something that they wasn't doing. And you know like I think in one of your tweets before um, I feel like you said that you wasn't black enough for black people or white enough for white people but obviously not if I hadn't seen that tweet for example I would feel like I would feel I feel like you're part of our culture if mm. that makes any sense do you feel like you're part of black British culture? The thing is with me, what people get twisted is I grew up in Quinton, which is quite a you know, troubled place in Birmingham. So my school that I grew up with, I went to school with Storage, Daniel Storage, etc. So that school was called Four Dwellings. It's 80% black. When I was, I think it was 13, 14, I moved to a predominantly white area. That's where I met Lewis and Ben and Reese, who are my my white friends who are uh, obviously the business owners of Gymshark, Abel, etc. That side of my upbringing gets missed because they only want to see who they see. I like don't take pictures and I don't post my friends as such. So I think people don't want to class me as black, which is cool. I don't mind, like I said, but they completely forget where I'm from and where I was raised. Because we, cause, cause we wouldn't know that, if that makes any this sense. Is what I'm as, saying, in like, yeah. as in like, you see how some people might the people that you're talking about that mm. don't see you as mm. being that, for <laughs> example. Like, that's not on our radar, if that makes any sense. As in, if I was taking you on face value, didn't yeah. know nothing about you and I saw you and I, I, I knew, okay, my man owns mm. this, I'd be like, raw, like, he's doing... I, I think that's the thing, though. So when you see, see me on face value, I may, I may not talk the same in terms of, um, you know, speak highly slang or what people typically defined as black, which is wrong in the first place, but that's just the name of the game. I don't dress the same as most people who in UK culture would define as part of the culture. And I guess also in terms of achievements, when you get to a certain height, they, they rule you out anyway. But like I said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a businessman. Uh, I'm here to, to not make money at all costs, but to make money ultimately and uh, take the path that makes sense for the future of the business and of, you know the future trajectory to stay relevant because in fashion as everybody knows to stay relevant for 10 years is a mammoth task and to stay uh, relevant for 20 is a, an even harder task so I've always just took the path which made sense for the business but like I said be 
because people don't see me in certain v uh, events and you know whatnot, I can understand why it's easy to say, oh, he's not part of us. And again, that's fine. I have no issues with that. You're you, so you probably experience it more because mm. you live your day-to-day -day life. But I think the biggest misconception about you or people think at times is that he's rich and moody or he's <laughs> rich or he's rich and angry, basically. Which, yeah, yeah, crazy. Which, which, by the way, in my head, yeah, there's way more worse things to be. I'll be quite honest, like, I've been one of those people before I've known you to think, oh, this guy's rich, but he's moody. Mm -hmm. Like, not in a, not in like a super like, oh, this guy's rich and he's moody, hateful way, but I'll be like, oh, this guy's rich and moody, man. <laughs> Why is he rich and moody? Like, but the more I thought about it, yeah, I thought, hold on. First of all, this ain't even the worst thing you can be in life. And secondly, who says just because you're rich means that you lose the ability to be moody? You know what it is? Because now most people of influence, their characters are very easy to see. They do a lot of podcasts, uh, you know, that you can see who they are. And I've always, like I said, I've, just, I've always tried to stay away from that kind of hype. Like I'll do one podcast a year or if, I, if, if someone reaches out to me like yourself and I respect and also I want to support you, I'll partake. But I don't do YouTube videos. I never did a day in the life. Even the business, you don't know what, you don't know how much I do in the business because it's never been about me. It's always about, it will do your job, focus on your fundamentals and run it up, you understand? So that's just the way I like it anyway, because I feel like if you look at the top celebrities in the world now, the, the very top ones, you can't, you don't really know them. And that's the celebrity nature. And like, again, I'm not trying to reverse engineer that or that's how I think, but that's how it should be. And you know what's mad? Half the time, the, the personality people portray anyway is an act until you meet them up close and you go, hold on a minute. You're a nice bubbly girl or guy on your YouTube channel, but you're actually an asshole in person. I want to focus on, on your achievements for a second. Obviously, as I said before, you know, everyone knows that you used to play a bit of football. Um, you wasn't the highest paid footballer <laughs> ever. Uh, I assume that at your height, you were getting about 3K a week at yeah. some point. Things didn't work out um, and you started to build your own business and you got a couple partners at the time. Mm. Um, Lewis and Ben, I believe, mm -hmm. at the time, right? What's the correlation between the two brands? As in, like, they've got... They were part of Gymshark at, at its inception as well, or how did that work? You mean MDV? So when I moved, like I said, from Birmingham to Bromsgrove, yeah. Lewis was like, I remember the first day of school, I remember there was a, like a half a basketball court anyway. I picked up the ball and I took a half court shot, which was obviously not a full court, but half court for them. And I've hit the shot first time. And I remember Lewis came to me and he was like, yo, I need you as my friend. And uh, me and him have been friends since that day and I was, what, 13, 14 years old. When I was 19, I believe, I think that's when they started Gymshark. And at the time it was like a supplements website. So who started Gymshark? Lewis and Ben. Okay, cool. So it was a supplements website and of course I didn't think nothing of it at the time. And they was drop shipping. Uh, there was this white labeling, a, a protein powder called it Gymshark powder. But it didn't really work. So then those two kind of like started to go to the gym quite heavy. Um, and then there was a time uh, that stringer vests were really a, a thing um, and I think the only stringer vest they could find was Gold's Gym and I don't know how much they cost but I remember they're saying they were too expensive for a, a piece of fabric with a print on so they just decided yo let's just make uh, a logo and put Gymshark on it and I remember at the time they just moved I think it was two years and they moved to like a small unit and I remember going and at the time I was earning yeah, as you said 2k a week so I had some money you know nothing major but I remember saying to them like yo if you need any money just let me know not like even as an investment just to like help out they said nah nah it's cool we'll just build slowly and then that was the start of it and then I think in the fourth year so I remember Lewis coming to me and saying like you dress a certain type of way and um you know, you need to just do something in fashion. So at the time, Lewis was like, Lewis and Ben were tight, they were business partners and obviously they're no longer tight, but I didn't really have any relationship with Ben. Like Ben went to the same school, but we just didn't speak. That was Lewis's. In fact, Lewis didn't even speak to him too much in school. I think they kind of came acquaintances through going to the gym and then having this kind of mutual idea. When you left to play football, basically they got tighter kind of thing. Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. So 
Lou said, yeah, do something in fashion, you know, you dress a certain type of way. So I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. He was like, oh, I need to bring Ben, ben in. And I was like, why? Like, me and Ben don't even chat. He was like, I know, but we made an agreement that every business venture we're going to do, we're going to bring each other in. I was like, all right, cool, I have to respect it. So that was the case of why Ben was brought in. And initially it was 33% each. I'm thinking it's going to be nothing. So I'm just like, whatever, I'm playing ball. Yeah, I'll make a couple designs and, you know, I'll make the ideas and whatever. So actually the only thing that was beneficial was that they had a warehouse at the time because they was obviously selling clothes. So I had like a wall in, in their warehouse. But then very quickly, obviously, we launched, uh, hence why the, the shares changed. It changed from 33% uh, each to 66% to me and 17% each for them. Uh, because obviously they acknowledge and fair play to them for doing that because they didn't have to. They acknowledge that, yo, I'm doing everything and then yeah. they have no interest. And then I think a few years later, Ben always said to me, I'll sell your shares, the remaining 17% to you because I don't care basically. So I bought Ben's shares off him, so that took me up to 83%. And then, Would I be prying too much if I asked how much you purchased them back for at that time? I think it was like 300,000, so, okay. but that was what? Jesus, seven, eight, seven years ago, maybe, maybe two years, two, three years in. How much is that worth now, just for context? Roughly at the low end. I think we did last year seven mil profit, uh, 10x on that, which is like the lowest multiplier you'll get in fashion. So what's that 70 mil, 17% on that, 10% is what? Seven mil, uh, 1% is, call it 10 mil. 10 mil. Again, that's easy to say in hindsight because- Of course, uh, of it, course, it, it's not relative, but it just gives yeah. An easier understanding of where the business is at now mm -hmm. and where it was at then. Yeah. That must have hurt at the time too, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah, must have did. thought, ouch. Yeah, yeah, it did 100%. Because, like, I think the, what, three years into business, I would have still play, been playing ball. I still would have, I probably would have took a pay cut. I would have been at, like, a Doncaster or Barnsley where I was earning, like, 1K a week. Actually, I took a, um, a management buyout loan from the bank, so it was more than everything I had at the time. So. That's me trying to say, like, I'm all in. I believe in what I'm going to do. And what made you care that much, though, at that point to buy that 17% when you already had 66%? I think, first of all, business is never guaranteed. And I, one thing about me is I'm always going to bet on myself heavily uh, because I know that my discipline is abnormal, especially if the variables I can control. Again, business, you can't control all the variables, but you can control a good amount. Of course, we can't control, control the economy. We can't control whether someone likes your stuff, but that's my job to kind of understand what people want and give it to them. But it was a risk all the way through. I remember my dad not speaking to me for a long time when I stopped playing football because he thought I was insane. Obviously, being from a Nigerian household, it's books, university lawyer or, you know, sometimes football. And again, I understand it from everybody's perspective because at that time, you know, the business would have been doing, I don't know, three, four mil turnover, probably like, you know, 10, 20% profit on that. So between three to 700K profit, which is a lot of money, obviously, but like uh, in, in football in terms, 700K a year, if you, if you crack, if you play Premier League, is not a lot of money. So that was probably my dad's logic. And who would have thought, maybe myself included to a point, it would have gone on to, the heights it's gone on to now. So hindsight's a wonderful thing, but even the share purchase, it could have easily just, the business could have gone backwards and I would have been in the red, oh, you of understand? Course, of so. course, you really took a risk on yourself at that point. So you bought the shares back mm -hmm. and then I guess it was just you and Lewis left in that company, Correct, right? Yeah. When he was still involved in Gymshark, for example, and you was in your brand with him, mm -hmm. like, why is he still part of that? Why did you want to keep him in there still now? I tried to buy his shares on many occasions, even um, before he exited Gymshark. And uh, he, he said to me, he was like, uh, again, Lewis knows me as good as anybody on this earth. And he knows what I'm capable of. And he knows my level of intelligence or discipline. He knows all of those factors. So uh, he's always like, well, if, if I'm going to bet on you too. So why would I sell my shares? And I completely understand that. The last time I spoke to him about buying the shares was many years ago, so I'm going to say five years ago. And obviously, again, the brand's grown a lot in that period. And in that time period as well, he's also ex had two exits from Gymshark, one for a smaller amount and one for a uh, well-known £100 million. So my, me buying his shares of him now 
it's not going to touch the sides. So it's, it, he might as well leave the business when I leave the business. And that makes perfect sense. If I was him, I'd do the same thing. So if he hadn't had Exit Gymshark or he hadn't had, had another uh, business venture, which was obviously an anomaly, which Gymshark is, I'm sure he would have sold his shares because the, the finances that I would have been able to offer would have changed his life, but it won't now. It could almost be a film because it's very, very, very rare that you find people that have known each other, mm. gone to the same school as each other, and build multi-million pound clothing brands No, 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 together. It, it should be a movie. If you look at the picture from the outside, you think this school must have been a, a private school, or this school must have been a school for entrepreneurs. This was like the, a council estate school. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about my friend's upbringings, but they had hard upbringings, like parents, you know, moving crazy, so. Then there's Reese who, uh, Reese owns Abel, Lewis invested into Abel as well. That's doing 40 million a year too. Um, so all of us are, you know, you know, doing well in the business world. But uh, I remember actually speaking to Lewis and Reese on many occasions. Reese was going to go into the army. He was this close to going into the army. I'm sure he will share that story at some point. Lewis was in university and he, I remember going to, when I was at my dad's house, he was like, I just want to get a job that pays 40k a year and I'll be happy. It wasn't even in our minds really that we could go onto the heights we've gone onto, but I guess it goes to show like just having friends who have the same mindset can spur you on because if Jim Shark hadn't have gone to do what he's do done, I wouldn't have started MDV. If MDV or Jim Shark hadn't gone and done to do what he's done, Reese wouldn't have started Able. Able, yeah, yeah. So it, well, I feel like a big thing in life is once you can see something's possible by someone you know, you feel like you can crack the code too. <laughs> So you said you're still cool with Reese, Lewis, yeah, yeah, yeah. and oh, it's the three of you, yeah, yeah. But what, you don't speak to Ben anymore? I, I never really did. Uh, okay. I never really did, and uh, I, obviously, I, can't, I think it's kind of public, the breakup between Lewis and Ben and Jim Shark. And that Some was, of us don't know in this, in this demographic, what was that? Jim, Jim Shark took off like six years into its inception when they hired the CEO called Steve Hewitt. Steve was like doing some advisory work for Jim Shark at the time and he was very good he came from Reebok and I remember Lewis asking me like oh Steve wants five percent of the business what should I do and I said you know if you do that you're going to put yourself in a weak position because obviously there's free shareholders and you have to dilute and if Ben and Steve or you and Steve come together and decide to you want one person out the door you're out the door and that's what happened effectively and obviously there was no real reason why Lewis is a flamboyant personality, but that same flamboyant personality got them to that point, you understand? So when they decided that they wanted to start being corporate and, you know, no laughs and jokes and just straight business, and that's when, you know, Lewis kind of got pushed out the door. Nevertheless, I actually was meeting Steve on the motorway to broker Lewis's first exit, which was a smaller amount. And of course, I didn't get nothing of it. It's my, it's my friend. So this was a seven figure amount. And the second exit was a nine figure amount. But I remember in lockdown, they offered him 20 million for his shares remaining 20%, something like that. And I remember Lewis calling me on a freeway phone in lockdown with uh, Reese, saying, What should I do? And I was just like, Look, forget about that. 20 mil is no chance they're doing. At this time, Jim, Jim Shark's moving mad. So they're doing like 30 mil profit, you understand? And they're growing crazy. And I said to him on the phone, yo, don't assume that this trajectory is going to continue because business don't work like that. It's your baby, you're holding on to it. I could, again, I understand someone's ripped it from you, but you can't fight a business making this type of money with, you know, you just can't fight. So I said, look, if I can get 100 mil, would you take it? Yes. 100 mil was wired in two weeks. I remember him sending me a screenshot, 100 mil cash just in the bank. And but you it, brokered that? It wasn't much broken. It wasn't like it needed to be. I'm his friend and they wanted to get him out and he wanted to get out. And now looking back, it looks like the best deal ever because uh, Gymshark is not what it once used to, uh, used to be. They're growing fast, but they're effectively buying revenue. Um, their gross margin is always dropping. The profit's always dropping. So if he was to try and do the same deal today, he would get way less. <laughs> Where does all your knowledge from business come from? Because, like you said, you was a football player, mm. you started your own business, but it feels like, you know, speaking to you, listening to you sometimes, it feels like you've really, like, read a lot of books or, I don't know, you just have, you feel, you feel like an old soul when it comes to business. Look, 10 years is a long time, so if you're actually, you know, skinning the game and 
100% every single day. You learn from your own mistakes and you also learn from mistakes of others. So my business knowledge is always stem from the long term. What, what sticks around and why does it stick around? And on the contrary, why, does, why is this business no longer around? Or why is this person no longer relevant? What are some of the, the companies that have potentially taught you that lesson in the fashion world that came and they've gone? Because I've got a lot of examples in my mm. field. No one in particular, and it would be probably unfair to name names anyway, but even if you look at the big brands, they, they're hot for five minutes and then, I'm not talking the luxury brands, but you know, like you might get the mid-tier brands, they're not gonna last. The business model is, is flawed. And when a business model is flawed and you can't adapt or recreate yourself, you're destined to fail eventually. And obviously things take longer than you expect normally to, to collapse. People hang on for longer than you think. That's just human nature, survival instinct. But I just think you can't fake it for long, you understand, and that's life. Any, anyone who's trying to front, they'll get found out. And obviously now from a distance, no one can tell who is who. That's a J-bar, but uh, everybody looks the same. Everyone's got a nice whip, everyone's got a nice watch. Everybody can't be shining. It doesn't work like that. The 1% of wealth is always going to be the 1% wealth and probably even more concentrated now with the economy. So how can everybody seem to be shining? And I think most of it comes from people's expectations are so high. Uh, and uh, I was reading something recently and it was saying like in the 50s, they said that that was the like golden time of happiness. But the truth is everybody almost had the same standard of living. Everybody's house looked identical. Everybody was pushing the same car, so nobody looked across your street and saw your neighbour with a shiny new thing. So you didn't get unhappy and think that you're not doing it. And I think the problem is now, the bar is always raising. I was speaking to my, my boy the other day and I was like, you know, do you know how mad it is now that you could have a Rolls Royce and nobody cares? Not to say that people should care, but I remember I was growing up, I saw an M3 and I was like, no way, BMW M3, like, but now M3s are like, yo, forget that. You pick up girl up in an M3, she don't rate you, which is crazy. Whereas if you pick a girl in a Rolls Royce, she's already been in one. She's been in three. And yeah. I think that change in standards and expectation is, is what's making people severely unhappy. And furthermore, what's even more mad is that the people who have these expectations can't even provide that for themselves. So yeah. you're, you have this level of, I want this bag, this crib, this car. And this is men and women too. And you're judging someone with less, but you can't even afford that less. I think that's insane. I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. And it's kind of like nothing's ever good enough anymore. No. You know, that, that girl that you've probably picked up in the Rolls Royce has probably been on a private jet 100%. once. Or do you get what I'm trying to say? Like there's nothing that is out of anyone's reach in terms of experience. No, it's crazy. Sometimes. Well, even though I have nice things and as like everyone, if you work hard, you deserve to buy them. But I never let them rule me. I think that might be a misconception from afar. And I completely understand why, because not that I post a lot, but if I post, I'm, I'm shining, you understand? But that's the whole point of social media, you know, like show people what you're moving with. I actually live what I move with. That's the difference. But I completely understand why people have this connotation of he's materialistic. But what people forget is, uh, I always say this to people, is um, it's relative. So if I purchase a car and someone else purchases a car, that, oh, that, that, that car may have been light work to me, but someone may have killed himself to me. So it's all relative. But what I do is, even though I like these things, I don't care about them at all. So yeah. you'll never hear me talk in an open conversation about, yeah, yeah, I just bought this. You might just see me with it. What I actually look forward to is waking up in the morning, having a coffee, going to my office or reading or learning something new. Coming home, I find my, my place, is, my home is my place of peace. So when I'm at home, I'm happy. You know, as long as I've got my laptop, a book I'm reading and I can learn and I can have a shisha, I'm happy. Talking about shining, what's um, the most expensive thing you've ever bought? <laughs> the, the, the store. <laughs> the store. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But obviously, personally, it's, it's cars, isn't it? Um, What's the most expensive car you bought then? Probably the, the Spectre, which comes in a few weeks. So what's the worst investment you've ever made? I've not really made too many bad decisions, to be honest, and I guess that's why I'm still here, you understand? Of course, you can make like bad stock purchases, but you learn from them. You can only make them once. And again, even if, if we're talking clothing, for example, even if I think this this jacket's going to be the best jacket I've ever made and I've bought a thousand of them and let's say the cost of it's £40 landed 
it's only a forty thousand pound out if you sell zero you understand so in fashion it's quite difficult unless you're talking about fixed fixed assets or fixed costs it's very difficult to make mistakes that can kind of take you down um, i think with business predominantly the mistakes people make are getting big shiny offices which cost you millions a year maybe retail in the wrong place um, hiring too many staff because obviously you know if you've got 500 staff all on average of 50k that adds up but I guess you can make people redundant but that's always something that I've never wanted to do I've never actually made a single person redundant even um, during COVID I didn't put nobody on furlough because I didn't want people to feel like there was their job was on the line do you understand so I've always with those kind of fixed costs or where people are concerned I've always been very calculated and I've always kind of stretched the operations side as long as possible to kind of not have to commit to make that fixed cost or at least when we do make that fixed cost we're more than ready for it financially. Let's just say you was on a boat you're in the middle of the ocean mm -hmm. there's one space in the boat you can only save one brand there's trap star in the ocean there's Ben Jot in the ocean you have to save one brand. You know what, I'm super cool with both of them, but I have to say, yeah, Jerome, because yeah, me and him have been cool for 12 years. I was with him in Dubai last year, actually, but he's always been a real one. So just because me and him are tighter, Jerome, but Mikey's super cool too. That question wasn't for the purposes oh. of um, segregation <laughs> the brands. We're championing them both. It was just a bit of entertainment because oh, okay. I wanted to know which one which jacket you might wear for Oh, you're talking bike. clothing? Yeah, of course. We love the I don't people. Know. I don't know. I think they're, they're both different. I actually spoke about this in the bio of Jerome. I was like, because he was, was talking about, you know, the, the lanes to go in and the direction to go in. I said, you know what? I see Ben J R more as like a, the grown trapper. You understand the, the 30 plus trapper or the 30 plus guy who grew up in, in the hood. And I think I said to him, you need to own that lane. I see Scraps wearing it frequently. And I said, he makes sense. He's your perfect uh, business advocate. Whereas I guess Trapstar, they, they still have that demographic, but they're more with the youth. So like, if I have to choose based on that, I'm going to say I'm, I'm over 30. So I'm going to go Ben JR. Obviously, you've had a bit of back and forth. It's well known with um, the CEO of Cortez. Where do you think those kind of things stem from? Like with him in particular? So there was a tracksuit that we made and um, you know, at the time, I didn't even know what Cortez was. So long story short, I hired a, a new buyer and a new designer. We've had like a brief of the products that we want to make in, a, in like six months time because we work so far ahead. One of the new designs who came from Daily Paper, I believe, uh, he showed me a tracksuit that was from Bape and it had the logo placement on the crotch. So I said to him, all right, cool, show me some designs. And I was like, uh, but, because obviously it has to be a patch because that's, it can't just be a, a, a logo across your, across your finger it has to be on a patch to kind of sit properly actually he came up with like a paramount inspiration of a mountain he was like you know uh, people subconsciously can relate to the paramount logo because they've seen it subconsciously in a movie and we're going to put out the logo for it and the stars people buy stars which is a fair point like people like to kind of engage with signs and symbols they're familiar with so we made it anyway long story short i woke up on Instagram one time and I see, I see my, uh, sorry, Twitter blowing up and I'm seeing, I think it was Clint, he said something like black on black crime. Again, I'm thinking, who's this guy? I'm checking the tweets, kind of worked out and I, in all fairness, I could see the resemblance. I've gone on my Instagram, as I said before, checked my DMs, he's DM'd me before. So I've gone back and I'm thinking, first of all, you was a fan at one point. If you had a problem, you you, you DM me then, so why don't you DM me now and say, yo, brother, the light. Um, like, yo, brother, what is this? Like, this looks like my thing. If he would have, I'm a reasonable person, so I would have said, yeah, you're right. But the inspiration was from Bape, so, but I can understand why you think it looks like yours. I would have took it down. I'm, a, I, I'm in the business of copying anyone, and, that, and that's clear. I have full respect for, for his thing. Like, I think his marketing skills are genius. And that's another thing, in the same breath from being compared to somebody and in the same breath from being criticised for making clothes not for the culture no more, so make your mind up which one is it. I'm either European and more stylistic or I'm trying to compete with Benji or Trapstone Cortez, it doesn't make sense. The people enjoy it, like the fans yeah, at home yeah, yeah. enjoy it. I think, to be honest though, it is a bit of a 
it's a sticky one because it's like obviously I respect the fact that you already acknowledge where that sim that that similarity come from. You t you've already taken ownership of for that. Of course, I was pissed when, when I when I realised. But like I said, like I, I'm at the time I'm like 31. I don't know what Cortez is. I think it's no. a, it was a new brand at the time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's understandable. You understand that. But then also as well, it's weird because say if he wanted to hit you just to message you mm. about that privately, maybe he might have felt in the moment that he couldn't because you probably hadn't yeah, yeah, engaged yeah. before. And he said black on black crime. Yeah, that's crazy, yeah. But, no, 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 but I don't think black on black crime is that crazy. He's, that's like, not the worst, not, that's, that's not, but I can feel how you took it as well. It's not the worst thing you could have said, if that makes sense. Like, he could have come out and been like, oh, you lot are copying me, boom, boom, boom. He nah, said you black, know what, you know what, do you get what I'm saying? Well, you, nah, if, if he would have copied me, I would have been probably as defended because it would have been, all right, fair enough. But for me, when someone says black and black crime, that's kind of like saying I'm trying to take take off your plate. And if anybody knows me, whether that's okay, whether that if 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 you ask Mikey, he's called my phone and asked for DHL rates to get them down. Can you kind of plug him? Yeah, Benji Art's called. Uh, Jerome's called me. Said, Yo, do you have a jean supplier? Yeah, send him supplier. Crept come to my yard for his nala, and I've gave him game. Clearly, all I've been trying to do is give people knowledge and show people the path because. Opening a store on Oxford Street with no investments, no funding, no nothing, and being profitable for 10 years straight, there's got to be certain in that. Yeah, what I'm getting from it as well is that you take your craft and your business too seriously to kind of entertain that kind of statement in public, yeah, basically. That's, and I understand, like I said, man, I'm, I'm an easy target because, like I said, everything stems around money, women, style, and all of that. So if people can attack me, they'll attack me because I make them feel insecure on all fronts. Are you the biggest black owned fashion house in the UK? On paper, yeah, but I don't think it really matters, does it? No, oh, it does in respect to what you're talking about in terms of like how people may see Yeah, you. yeah, well, again, I'm, I'm a man of facts, not speculation. So factually, yeah, for sure. But forget black, black aside, even in general, if we're talking about like ownership and equity value, race aside, yeah, especially being privately owned. You seem like a serious, disciplined man. Like, obviously, I know for a fact that I've heard you say you don't really go out much mm. partying. You hate spending money on alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a year, how many times do you go out? Once, twice. I invited you to the gala before. I, I didn't even see that, you know. No, I reckon you're sorry for I ain't going out. No, nah, no, nah, I didn't see that, though. I'll, <laughs> I'll come to the next one, innit? Oh, uh, yeah, no, you got to be there. But, you know, in London, if I go out, it's, it's 10 Gs, you understand? Yeah. I, I, and I don't even drink. So I'm there copping big bills to, to for what, you understand? I'm tired. So you don't drink, you don't party. So what, what, is, what do you do for fun? Well, and I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting what you do is wrong mm, at all, mm. actually. I'm just trying to understand. What do you do for fun? Like, what's the fun? You know, what's you fun know, for you? You know what's funny, yeah? Because people always say this to me, and I'm like, yo, this is the thing. What, how I live my life, or the simplicity in my life, is fun to me. Yeah, but you could do that for free, though. I know, I know, but this, this is the whole point. I think people have this connotation of, you're making money to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I'm making money just to sleep peacefully, and no, I have to, never have to think about money again. And not only that, as a man, we have to think about way down the line. So, what, I'm 32 now, as much as, you know, you're only young once, um, you've got a long life to live. And as men, we live, we live through our family anywhere. We live through women and children, do you understand? So, but have you ever been lit once? What do you mean, like, mash up? Lit. Mash up is, is the extreme end of lit. When I go on holiday, I yeah. do. But, okay. But whilst I'm in London, this is work. This is my, this is my place of work. And I'm you okay. don't go on holiday often either? Twice a year. Twice a year, yeah. for how long? Ten days at a time. Ten days at a push. I can only go away for like four days max. Really? And I start getting anxiety. I'm always working though, that's the thing. So even if I'm from holiday, my, my routine kind of remains the same in the day. So I'll wake up, go to the gym, get on my laptop, and then obviously depending on what time zone I'm in, once the staff have finished work, I'm active. What kind of experiences have you had that you can comfortably speak about that you only know or find out once you've reached a, 
a certain level of success or, or of success or what people actually deem to be a certain level of success. It might not even be success to you. Success for me is happiness and I'm happy uh, and I'm calm and, and I think me and my friend always say my biggest achievement is that I can remain sane at my, at my position because uh, obviously give most men this type of money or whatever, they're going to be moving mad. They're going to be power abusers, they're going to be buying people effectively or making it all about them ego themselves. And also my friends also say to me that why they respect me so much is because I'm still the same as I was when I was a kid. I feel like when you're a calm person and you've always got your stuff together or you always seem to have the answers, I think everybody treats you as if you're superhuman, like you don't feel nothing. It's very rare that people actually check in and go, how are you? It's always, they always want something, they always want to can you help me with this? Can you give me some advice on that? Can I have some money? Um, and again, like I said, as a man, and I'm all good, good with this, that's cool. But every now and again, I'm like, damn, like, people think, even my staff sometimes, they think they don't, because I handle stress so well and I've always seemed to be calm, composed, have the answer, and everything always goes in an upper trajectory, they think that that just comes, like, naturally. So they don't ever think, you know what, he could be mad stressed today, let me just try and make his life a bit easier. Or I'm always the, the carrier of someone else's burden. And I feel like when you don't complain, people think that you're superhuman. So who's been your biggest support then? And my solitude, <laughs> to be honest. I know that sounds weird, but why, I guess, um, yeah, recluse is because that time alone in my own head solves a lot of, I can, I can rationalize everything and again, I feel like to stay staying at this level, uh, you have to have a high level of empathy. You have to understand why people behave the way they do. Because I think there's a times where you can take it personally. Even going back to what you said about the online, I understand why people behave this way. They're mad, you know, they're, they're angry at the position. And um, I understand why people are, don't see the other side because they they grew up self-centered. They didn't grow up being raised necessarily by parents who said, ask the other side first or be, be selfless. I think we're in survival mode and again in the economy it doesn't help. Everyone's in survival mode and they're selfish. They don't consider other people's feelings or situation. Yeah, would you have left to achieve? Everything. In terms of like business and finances, I never ever set goals like that to be honest. And achievement it comes from, you know, to dissimilar from what I just said, is through your family, you understand. I've sacrificed myself now for the last 10 years, so my present family, my mom, my dad, etc., they don't ever have to think about money ever again. When I have wife and kids, they don't ever have to worry about the things that I had to worry about growing up or, you know, in my 20s, early 20s, you know what I'm saying, about money struggles or not even that, just like the mental side of it. I know that whatever someone's gone through, I'm not saying I have the answer, but I can give you good guidance. <laughs> Yo, so look, I want to go over some of your tweets. All right. If your man sells e-com courses, get a new one. 100. Frauds in motion, lives in Dubai, put seven or eight figures in their bio, drives a Eurus, has a Rolex GMT. Have you got a Rolex GMT? I do, I've got a few. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not on today, not on today, I'm not joking. on today. Shows bags from shopping trips. Mm-hmm. Post Spotify <laughs> screenshots, mm -hmm. but company's house says you're loss making. Facts. That's half of Twitter nowadays. Bro, this is my point. What have you got against GMT? You don't fuck with the GMT? No, I do, but not with all of that. Not with all this. All of that mixed in. And again, this is what I was saying before. Everyone's just fronting. And I have no issues with man stretching himself a little bit, but like, the problem is, and what, what offends me, is the damage it does to people who look up to you. What's your favourite watch that you own? Because I'm a watch fanatic, you know? And I see you got a nice piece on today. What is it, a Frank Miller? No, JLC, rate me. <laughs> <laughs> rate me. Yeah, J, J Gale Couture, reverso. I said Frank Miller, you know, rate me. I, did, I, I just saw the corner of it. I didn't nah, see the whole nah, tray. The reverso thing. That is crazy. Hold on, let me get that on the, yeah. on the camera. So is that your favourite one, this one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just like classy and clean. But I don't even wear watches too tough, to be honest. I sometimes just have to like 
pull one out just to make it make sense. What's your take on crypto? Uh, US dollar is weak. Um, inflation is high, so it makes sense. But you know, it's funny. I think it was like two years ago when I was when I was on holiday, and I just saw all the man with Bitcoin chains, and I was thinking. And then I, I remember going back on holiday to the same places like a couple of years later. I didn't see nobody. Of course, it is. Nice. The 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 it's beach bigger. beach clubs were empty. The restaurants were empty. Like no Bitcoin holders anymore. What's your favorite luxury brand? Bottega Veneta, no doubt. I think it's uh, classy, clean, logoless, just like you know. It's just the silhouettes are calm. The quality is always top tier. What designer would you have loved to? design for you? Obviously R.I.P. Virgil, I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted to design for me, but um, yeah, he's he was the truth. He's, he died, what, three, four years ago now? It's almost like, look at Off-White. Off-White's not done, but pretty much done now. And it goes to show, man, like, people say they support you, but when you're dead, they don't support you. It's almost like, and that's why I said going back to the start, who cares what people think? Like, you die and no one gives a fuck, do you understand? So. Um, as long as your family's good and they love you and they remember you, that's all that matters. Fucking okay, no. hell. You're going to get drunk one time this year just to, like, you know, just be lit one day this year, man. I'm, I'm lit, man. That's what I'm saying. Every day, every day internally, I feel lit. Say no more. Every day. No, it's been an honour and pleasure to uh, meet you and have a conversation with you and actually get into the mind and inner workings of how you've been able to successfully build one of the biggest fashion brands, if not the biggest, from somebody who's English. Um, and I feel like, you know, whether people or not take the time to listen or get to know the man mm. behind some of the savage tweets sometimes, it's up to them, but you don't give a shit. Anyway. Bro, you know what it is in this world? Everything's so fake that when you're real for one second, people get offended. And at the end of the day, the proof is in the numbers. The proof is in the man. Those who are set to achieve great things or have a different mentality to others will take it in and go, you know what, the man's not crazy, he's just saying what needs to be said. So what do you think of Kanye West then? Okay, he might have gone a little bit too far. Uh, 